it's an honor to be here, uh, you know, at, at this school, you know, with you and to have the chance to um, kind of reflect back on some of the early work that we did and, uh, and that uh, time when we were in New York City together and um, both teaching and practicing. Um, and in a way, um, it's a little bit uh, how I wanted to structure what I would present tonight, um, which is to say that um, uh, in our practice, the living, we've always thought of, um, of kind of architecture as an ecosystem with interconnected loops of ideas, technologies, culture, uh, the natural environment, humans, uh, the city, uh, non-humans, uh, and projects all kind of mixing together. And the, the reason I'm describing it as an ecosystem and putting all those things into kind of one big category is that we see this ecosystem as being important, um, each loop affecting the other loops. And in other words, that maybe it, it's difficult to make sense of a single loop alone. Um, so one way of thinking about that is that our projects, which are themselves loops in this ecosystem, um, are always influenced by a lot of work uh, done before us. And similarly, our projects always try to leave a kind of open-ended hook for other projects to um, pick up where, where ours left off, for other people to kind of take the work forward um, and to kind of consider um, design as one uh, kind of big interconnected system. Uh, with that in mind, I want to describe um, a few different uh, approaches to design that we've been experimenting with over the past few years, um, and also a few different projects. So I'll show about six different uh, approaches and six projects and, and try to explain how we, we think about design and how we practice design in this ecosystem. Um, but the funny thing I want to do, um, speaking of kind of loops, is to start uh, at the end and then loop all the way back around uh, uh, from the end to the beginning and then back to the end again. So the first thing I want to do is show uh, a video that we created um, for one of our most recent projects. It's the one, uh, one of the ones that Beth was mentioning. Uh, for uh, the Museum of Modern Art and MoMA PS1 in New York City. So this is kind of where, about where we are now. Um, and then after this, I'm gonna kind of describe how we got here.
so this project is called Hi-Fi, and it's a project that's about uh, creating a new type of building material, a uh, lightweight, low-cost, uh, biodegradable brick, um, and also oops, a new um, approach to architecture, um, architecture that uses uh, almost no um, energy, uh, almost no, creates almost no carbon emissions, um, and is entirely biodegradable and compostable at the end of its life. Um, where am I here? There we go. Um, so that's one of the most uh, recent projects that we did. Um, but I want to now um, describe some of the um, research method um, and design method um, that kind of brought us to this point of uh, developing uh, one of our most recent projects. So the kind of baseline, or point zero out of our six points, uh, the baseline to all of our work is prototyping. And this is a, an approach that involves uh, a design method that we invented called flash research. And uh, Beth was describing this. Um, this is um, a way of doing architecture that we came up with uh, that involves self-imposed constraints. So. Uh, a budget of $1,000 or less, a duration of a month or less, um, but that nevertheless aims to explore a new architectural idea through full-scale functioning prototypes. Um, and it kind of operates something like this. Um, these are a few different videos. Um, each video represents a prototype. We create about a prototype a week to incrementally explore an idea. So we make something, see how it works, test it, um, evaluate it, and then make something else and gradually um, build up ideas and functionality. Uh, one of the examples of a, an early flash research project we did um, began uh, with a material. In this case, uh, a wire called shape memory alloy, or sometimes called muscle wire. And this is a thin wire that contracts along its length when you apply electricity to it. Um, and at the end of three months, after spending about $1,000 on prototyping, we created this, uh, which we call living glass. So, it's basically um, a thin transparent surface or a kind of glass that opens and closes gills inside it uh, based on sensors. So here you can see that it's triggered by a carbon dioxide sensor and this allows you to breathe into the, the glass, the building envelope, um, and it kind of breathes back at you. And, and this, uh, is, this happens because of the shape memory alloy and it allows architecture to both uh, do something functional to control airflow in a room, um, but also to become a register of information. Uh, for projects like this, we document them not only through photographs and videos, but through things like source code, um, circuit diagrams, and instruction manuals. Uh, and here are two examples of instruction manuals that we created um, after doing a flash research project that allow others to kind of uh, build off of what we learned. And one example of that is a project uh, from a class uh, that we taught at Columbia. It started with the same shape memory alloy material I was describing, uh, but our students obviously took it in a totally different direction. This project is called the Huggy Wall. Um, and we also build off of our own work. So after doing the project Living Glass, we're very interested in how sensors are embedded in buildings. Um, and buildings are getting more and more sensors every day. But in general, buildings uh, stand alone. And we were imagining, what if buildings could share their sensor data with one another and create a kind of social network uh, of information, a kind of bottom-up smart grid? Um, in order to explore this idea, we created some custom sensors for air quality, some custom software to um, kind of aggregate that data, and a larger version of this breathing building envelope. And more specifically, uh, we were very interested in taking some low-cost sensors, sensors for 
uh, uh, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. These are two important contaminants of our air quality. Uh, we connected them to a simple radio unit um, and a low cost battery. And then we had uh, what were basically portable sensor units. So these didn't need to be plugged in anywhere. We could install them on the facades of buildings, on the exterior, um, but also inside buildings. And they could be gathering information, uh, collecting it, and sharing it with other nodes in the network. One of our first installations was on the facade of the Empire State Building, uh, shown here. You see these sensors uh, um, uh, on the exterior of the building. And they were uh, not only collecting data, but uh, sharing it uh, with other buildings by sending it to the internet and making it available uh, for download. Um, so we collected the input from the Empire State Building and several other buildings, sent it to a gallery uh, in New York City, the Van Allen Institute Gallery, and basically had a building facade that was able to act not only on its local information, um, but on information from other parts of the city and even uh, from other cities. And we had one version of the installation where we had a network of these nodes collecting data from a building in New York City and a network of these nodes collecting data from a building in San Francisco, sharing information with each other in real time and creating a kind of network of information. Um, one of the important uh, ways that we think this may affect you know, the buildings of the future is that if buildings have a kind of uh, ecology of information, um, you know, a, a, a network of data from other buildings, then buildings could literally start to cooperate with one another to share resources um, such as energy use in the city. Okay, now I'm going to quickly describe um, a few different approaches that we've been exploring that all kind of rely on this uh, prototyping foundation. And the first one um, we're uh, categorizing as design with information. This is a project in Seoul, South Korea, and in many ways it picks up on the topic of air quality um, that the other project uh, kind of initiated for us. Um, these are two photos um, taken from the same location in Seoul, um, and they show that the air quality fluctuates greatly uh, from day to day, uh, like in many cities. Um, Seoul has some uh, really interesting existing interfaces to real-time air quality. On the left, you see a digital billboard that's displaying in real-time a number, uh, which is the level of uh, PM10. That's an important contaminant uh, in air. And so it's showing you know, 244 as a, as a reading. It gives uh, the citizens an interface into what their air is like right now. Um, and there's also a couple of interesting websites in the city that display a map of the city and real-time air quality. The city of Seoul, like uh, you know, many other uh, modern cities uh, with a lot of new buildings, also has this culture of dynamic LED facades. Um, so these are facades of a variety of types of buildings that have multicolored LEDs and they display things like rainbow patterns or moving flowers. Um, but we were interested in, in asking whether we could combine these two things, um, real-time information about the environment and dynamic building facades so that we could think of the skyline of the city or the buildings of the city as communicating important information, not simply displaying advertising or some pattern of their own or for their own use, but displaying something that's uh, kind of public, that's for the city, that's for the citizens. And the way we tried to kind of enact this or make a prototype of this idea of building facades of the future uh, was to start with a map of the city, uh, locate the 27 different existing air quality sensors that the government runs. And these are the black dots. Then we redrew the map of the city according to air quality boundaries instead of uh, uh, political boundaries uh, or neighborhood uh, boundaries. Um, and then we took this map and we kind of bent it into um, a physical building facade or a canopy. Um, and our idea was to create um, this example of a new building facade in the city um, that we could explore some of these ideas of an ecology of information. Um, we used a variety of digital tools um, in the design process, including ones that could um, translate from a kind of wireframe model 
to a more resolved detail model, to the files for laser cutting, um, to actually um, the final construction drawings. And this was important for us because we were designing in New York, but we had to fabricate in Seoul in just three days. Um, but I think most importantly what this project did for us is it uh, gave us a chance to um, explore a version of interactive architecture um, that works in three basic ways. And uh, the first is that this uh, pavilion, uh, which is a kind of permanent construction in a public park in Seoul, so this pavilion is a display of air quality improvement. And that's because uh, it's a map of the city and each panel, which corresponds to each neighborhood, illuminates if its air quality is better right now than a year ago. So if you see, uh, if you take a glance at the map and you see that some neighborhoods are illuminated and some are not, you know that the ones that are illuminated, their air quality is improving by a very low resolution uh, measurement. Um, second, every hour the map goes dark and the panels or the neighborhoods illuminate in order of best current air quality to worst. So this is a display of uh, real-time air quality and it's a comparison between neighborhoods. The first example is a comparison between one neighborhood over time and then this is an example of a comparison between neighborhoods at a fixed time right now. But most important or most interesting for us for the future of cities is that we created this uh, very simple uh, text message interface so you could text message in a zip code to a hotline that we created and you're requesting information about that neighborhood which was this panel here that panel blinks twice and then you get back on your phone the real-time air quality of that neighborhood um, and the thing that's interesting to us about that is that it's connecting um, this kind of level of information that we have personally on our phones uh, with something public because it's a way of giving you information that you can request in many different ways on your phone um, but it's also collecting all of our requests for information about air quality putting them on one single place and allowing us to see what we are collectively doing about this issue now it's admittedly a prototype of that idea it's a kind of low resolution version of that but in a way, it's, a, it's an initial uh, indicator of public interest in an important issue about the city, which is air quality. In other words, if you glance at the map and you see a lot of blinking, you know a lot of people in the neighborhood are interested in air quality right now. Um, if you see more blinking in one neighborhood than another, then you know uh, more people are interested in air quality in that neighborhood. And it's a way of um, giving us a kind of collective register of what we're all thinking about and allowing us to um, think about it, ask questions, maybe explore deeper. Um, so this is still standing. We built this uh, several years ago now. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of interesting part of the public life of this part of the city. Different people use it um, kind of in different ways. Um, it has this kind of physical aspect of um, being a kind of constructed object in the city, um, but it's also this layer of information. And in other words, it's making visible some things that are normally invisible um, about the environment. Two, design with environment. So um, at about the same time we were working on this project with air quality in Seoul, we were also working on a project with water quality in New York City. And this project, which was a prototype a few years ago, has grown into um, what we're showing here in this rendering, uh, which is scheduled for construction this summer. And this is basically a 200 foot long floating pier in the East River uh, in Manhattan um, that is basically a layer of light uh, hovering above the surface of the water that changes color and blinks according to water quality, presence of fish, and again, human interest in the environment. Um, it's a project that started in many ways with a kind of question and an exploration like many of our projects. And here, part of the idea was to say, is there um, a place that we could take um, this layer of information about the city 
um, or this technology for sensing and controlling data, is there a place where we could take this stuff um, that it isn't already? And we thought, well, one good example of that might be uh, the water. Um, because the water is, of course, close to the city. It's an important part of the life of the city. But we don't have uh, a grid there. We don't have electronics there. Um, and so we don't have there, for the most part, any of this um, so-called Internet of Things. And so that was part of the experiment of this project, bring, bring that technology out into the water. Um, how it works more specifically is that we have uh, an array of these floating tubes. These are six foot long transparent tubes, half underwater, half above water, with sensors below water and lights above water. Um, each of the tubes has some lights and some electronics, including these microcontrollers. These are small Arduinos. Um, we kind of network these things together. Um, we use a variety of kind of hacked together technologies, including this uh, fish finding sensor um, that we're repurposing for a different use, another uh, text message interface. Um, and this gives us a way to create um, and design with a kind of layer of light, a layer of information in the city that's in dialogue with some of the other um, lights and information of the city. Um, so here you see the Manhattan Bridge, and in the background, the Brooklyn Bridge. And in the foreground, our network of floating tubes. Um, in the context of New York's uh, kind of urban uh, uh, skyline, but also its kind of industrial skyline. Um, and maybe one of the important ways uh, for us to uh, think about this project, especially as we imagine it um, going forward or having a, a greater relevance than a test installation, is that um, there's kind of a dialogue here between the colored lights in the city. So in the background, this is uh, the famous building that everyone knows, the Empire State Building. It, um, it basically has dynamic lights. Um, and it's communicating information to the city. Um, but the Empire State Building, uh, basically, it changes uh, colors generally about once a day. And it communicates things like holidays or Mariah Carey concerts. Um, and our network of s very similar technology, in a way, um, is changing more than once a second and displaying things um, like presence of, of fish or you know, life in the water um, and the quality of the water um, and our kind of interest, our collective interest in this issue. So it's a, a little bit of an exploration of like what, what our building facades that are dynamic could be. Um, here you get a sense of our kind of prototyping methodology. We were doing a lot of testing. Uh, on land because it's hard to do um, a lot of tests in the water just logistically. Um, so here we're testing out um, some of the interactivity of the system. We're getting ready to do the first um, installation, um, staging it on uh, a pier and then uh, moving it out into the water. You see the, the blinking lights and the lights that uh, change colors. And you see how these bobbing uh, lights in the water also register in a kind of passive way um, the flow of the river. The East River is actually a very fast flowing river. Um, it flows in both directions. Um, and this gives us yet another way that just a simple interface can tell us something uh, important about the flows of the city around us. Here's a, a kind of time lapse in near real time where you see a, a kind of tipping point moment. The lights shift from a reddish color to a bluish color, and that's because the water quality has hit a tipping point of improvement. Um, so this started out actually as a flash research project where we built a single floating module. Um, then we developed it into a, a grant proposal and partnered with an incredible artist named Natalie Jaramajenko. Uh, we, we won a, a competition for funding to um, put a small network of these lights out in the river um, uh, a few years ago. Um, so we kind of developed the, um, the, the project and the idea from one uh, local 
uh, remote uh, buoy that was sensing just water quality to a network of about 25 uh, buoys, and they were testing water quality, presence of fish, and uh, human interest. And then um, our the version that will be in construction this summer is basically a much larger and a permanent commission by the city of New York. Um, it will have a lot of the same functionality, but one layer we're adding, and the reason I'm describing this is to show how we add new ideas and new experiments each time we, we do a version of a project. Um, we're adding a layer of biological sensors. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, well, here you see a tank of mussels. These are live mussels, you know, the shellfish mussels. And it's a sped up uh, time lapse, but you basically see this kind of pulsing or jittering of the mussels, and that's because they're opening and closing their shells small amounts. Uh, well, it turns out that the rate and the amount that a mussel opens and closes its shell is a very sensitive and sophisticated detector of water quality. In fact, a better detector of water quality than our most uh, expensive digital sensors. So um, with that in mind, and we learned this from some scientific research papers, um, with that in mind, you can glue a $2 Hall effect sensor to one side of a mussel's shell and an inexpensive magnet to the other side. And at a high resolution, you can monitor when a mussel is opening and closing its shell and how much. And this allows us to use living mussels as a detector of water quality. Um, here was one of our first uh, test installations. This is uh, what's called a mussel sock. Um, this is how mussels are grown in, in many parts of the world, including in Venice, Italy, which is where we did this first version. And here you see we've taken a mussel sock of native Venice mussels, um, attached uh, several different sensors uh, to mussels along the length of the sock. Um, we're running wires back to um, some microcontrollers, some custom software on a laptop. And this allows us to combine, in a way, the best of the computer with the best of nature. Or in other words, to combine uh, you know, the age-old goal in computation of artificial intelligence with something that's uh, been around for potentially millions of years, which is a version of natural intelligence or biological intelligence. Um, to put it differently, this allows us to use computation as a design tool, but also use biology as a design tool, and even combine them within the same project and the same interface. Um, here you get a sense of some of the underlying technologies and some of the initial test installations in a canal in uh, Venice and a different canal. Um, and so again, I guess, Part of the reason I'm describing these projects this way is to give you a sense of the, the um, kind of things we take from each project, from each test installation, from each experiment, and the things we bring forward into future uh, projects and designs, and that we try to offer back to a larger discussion about design uh, with our peers, including uh, with you. Um, and that is to say you know, that, that really we think this combination of, uh, of computers and the synthetic uh, with biology and the natural um, is going to produce uh, some really interesting new territory. Number three, design with personal communication. Uh, this is a project we did for a Biennale in Shenzhen, uh, China, and Hong Kong. And uh, this was a, a very fast project, a, a pretty low budget project. Um, and one of the things we wanted to explore here was taking this um, stuff that we'd been exploring about sensors and the environment um, and giving it a twist or, or uh, exploring it you know, with a new angle in a new way. Um, and what we decided to do was combine two things that we thought were very interesting and uh, unique about these two cities, Shenzhen and Hong Kong. And one is the culture of eating uh, street food um, out in in the streets, in these uh, temporary stalls, creating a very social public life of the city. And also um, the feature of these cities as being a place of manufacture of a lot of uh, electronics, both low cost electronics like the LEDs we've been using for a few years, and also, of course, high cost electronics like our cell phones. 
And we wanted to combine those two things, street food and electronics, um, in an admittedly bizarre um, idea, which was to create um, custom-designed soup bowls. Um, and you know, along the way in the project, we uh, used you know, this familiar uh, machine, a CNC milling machine, but not to create a kind of expressive new architectural form. Instead, to take a low-cost um, soup bowl, these white uh, upside-down bowls here, that are normally used in these street food stalls, and carve away a very precise amount of the bowl um, so that we could create a, a, a pocket in the bottom of the bowl and hide in there these hacked scrolling LED badges. This will all make sense in a minute. But so these are our ingredients: you know, the milling machine, these low-cost soup bowls, um, these scrolling LEDs, um, and that allowed us to do something like this, which was basically invite um, international art and architecture curators to program in custom messages, um, and you'll see it kind of appearing in the LED badge here. These are text message length messages that are really um, small manifestos about the city. They're observations about the city um, that are composed you know, by this um, uh, community of artists and architects. And then we take that message, we put it in the bottom of the soup bowl in that little pocket that I was describing that we milled out. <laughs> and we get this kind of secret um, a soup bowl that looks like a normal soup bowl, but it has a surprise in the bottom. And here you see um, actually some public uh, security officers, and, and they're not um, trying to arrest us or anything. They're trying to show their friends this weird uh, magic trick that we somehow invented. Um, here is our translator. Um, we develop partnerships with several of these uh, street food vendors uh, who have these stalls. Um, and here's one of our bowls in action. Uh, you go up to these stalls, you order different vegetables or tofu or meat, and, um, and uh, they're often created in this uh, you know, broth that's semi-transparent. And here, the material of the food, the properties of the food, material properties of the food was an important part of the design because it allowed us to create um, a bowl that uh, when you first receive it with your food, uh, it looks like a normal bowl, but by the time you get to the bottom, uh, something else is going on. Uh, the messages that were composed were, were things like this. So this is what you would see scrolling by uh, at the bottom of your soup bowl. And here's another one. Um, and really this was a way of you know, basically taking this layer of digital information in the city in a way, the same layer that we had been exploring in the previous projects about environment, but adding a level of um, uh, individual feeling, you know, what it's like to be an individual in the city, um, what it's like to um, think about the city as another important layer of information. So in other words, adding you know, a layer of culture uh, or uh, social engagement to this layer of more objective information. Um, you know, we get something like this, which is um, a way of communicating that's at once personal and public. In other words, you know, it's obviously uh, your, your own food. That's something very personal. You're, you know, um, consuming it, uh, you know, in a very individual way. Um, but the messages themselves and the venues out in the streets of the city were very public. Um, in a way, so this gives you a sense of uh, what it was like to experience this, you know, at first you would see nothing going on, then you would think something strange is happening here. <laughs> and only gradually and slowly as you eat your food um, is the message revealed. <coughs> you know, so one other thing that we liked about this was that we were bringing the venue of the Biennale out into the streets. You know, the, these events that are normally held in kind of civic centers or galleries for a, a fairly narrow audience. We were bringing that out uh, into the streets, to the citizens, uh, to the public life of the city. Okay, four, design with ecosystems. Um, this is a project that um, allowed us to explore 
uh, the kind of complexity of interacting forces. You know, so if previously I was describing like a layer of um, environmental information in the city, and then I'm trying to describe a layer of um, social information in the city with these soup bowls. Um, we're very interested in how all of these layers interact with each other and influence each other. So we kind of challenged ourselves to create a project um, that would involve designing an ecosystem and setting it up and then letting it play out without our intervention um, to kind of see how it would unfold. Uh, like in many of our projects, we started with the material and material properties. In this case, um, a familiar material to everyone. Um, this is honey dripping off of a spoon back into a jar. And you see how it has this coiling effect. It doesn't drop into one kind of uh, pile, but it has this coiling effect because it's a viscous liquid. And it turns out that you can take a viscous liquid like honey, but uh, you can also take other viscous liquids like this is uh, recycled plastic that's melted down and has behaviors of a viscous liquid. If you drop a viscous liquid like these onto a conveyor belt instead of into just a stationary jar, then you can get some really interesting patterns just by changing one variable. Um, so if you um, have the conveyor belt going pretty fast, you get a straight line. Slower, you get a wavy line. And even slower, then you get um, more complex patterns like figure eights or other complex patterns, kind of like sewing machine uh, types of patterns. Um, so we wanted to design a system where this was one ingredient, this layering up of a synthetic material, which is this viscous plastic. And the second material we wanted to um, add to the mix was a natural material, and this is moss, you know, living moss, the plant, uh, suspended in a liquid and being kind of sprayed out. So we're basically putting a synthetic material, this plastic, and a natural material, this moss, into the same physical space as a kind of aggregation of material over time. And we're trying to grow a new version of architecture um, but that's not formulated from the top down, rather that's built uh, from the bottom up. Um, so we add one more ingredient to the mix. You know, we have the synthetic material, the plastic, the natural material, the moss, and we have this, what we're calling a material of ideas. And that is that um, we're monitoring real-time web searches about terms like construction and environment. And those real-time web searches are uh, controlling in real time how much moss and how much plastic gets added to the mix. Um, and this allows us to explore a very simple version of an ecosystem with vegetation, construction, and imagination all interacting. Uh, the challenge that we gave for ourselves was to set up this ecosystem as uh, a kind of uh, in a way, like a large-scale um, bottom-up 3D printer. Um, set it going in a room uh, and uh, design the rules, but not the final form. Uh, in other words, we would let this thing play out based on the rules for 30 days uh, without um, intervening. Here you get a sense of what it's like as it layers up over time. Um, I should mention that the conveyor belt that I was describing is actually a rotating disc, which acts much like a conveyor belt. Um, and you see that as this disc is rotating around, you're getting a layering up of plastic and moss. And in a way, the more plastic that grows, the harder it is for the moss to take hold. And the more moss that grows, the harder it is for the plastic to layer up on top of itself. Um, and this gives you a sense of about the first um, 10 days of the 30-day exhibit. You see, like many ecosystems, a kind of equilibrium, this cylindrical shape building up. Um, but for a, a few different reasons, um, including some reasons of data and of uh, materials, there's a kind of uh, tipping point and a kind of moment of chaos or disequilibrium. Um, but interestingly, over time, um, there was established a kind of new equilibrium, but a more complex one. So instead of a cylindrical growth kind of extruded up, um, you get a kind of banding, uh, almost like a weaving of these, uh, you know, four-inch diameter braids. Um, and that is how the, the, uh, the new equilibrium developed uh, 
kind of over time and for the rest of the exhibit. Um, so this is another project that is, you know, a, um, I, that I will admit is a kind of bizarre experiment, uh, you know, for the future of architecture. But one of the ways we think it's particularly relevant is that it was um, a project where we kind of gave ourselves um, the challenge of designing with uncertainty, designing without um, complete control of the system. Um, designing with forces that we knew were kind of beyond our ability to completely um, understand and that would shift in ways that we wouldn't be able to predict. Um, because remember, this was being driven by real-time searches, web searches, and those could have gone uh, in different ways. And, you know, those are not only interesting, like, kind of theoretical constraints. We really actually believe um, that those challenges, designing with uncertainty and the other ones I mentioned, are really important for the design of the buildings and, and cities of our future. Um, and that's reflected in a way in a lot of the recent thinking about um, design with resiliency. Um, in New York City, um, it's a very real part of the design context that Hurricane Sandy struck a few years ago. And as people are trying to figure out how can we design with the, the future possibility of mega storms, how can we design with possible flooding in mind, how can we design for conditions that are beyond what anyone ever thought was possible, um, that does seem like an important um, challenge for us as designers to get used to that possibility and to design systems that are possibly robust, that can resist um, forces of change, um, but possibly that uh, are able to adapt to that change, change uh, over time based on that change, and, and in, in some ways potentially get better um, based on those stresses and challenges. Um, this is a, uh, an approach um, that we're calling design with evolution. Um, and this is uh, an approach and a project um, that in many ways thinks of uh, a new way of um, designing uh, using the best that a computer has to offer, um, but also drawing on some uh, important parts of biology in the natural world. So similar to the kind of digital sensors and biosensors I was talking about earlier, but this uh, in a different phase of design and, and in a different framework. Um, and I'll just describe this one fairly briefly, but um, part of the premise of this project is that uh, biology of today um, is very different than biology of 100 years ago. Now, of course, um, architects have been fascinated by biology, inspired by biology for, for many years, hundreds of years or more, including you know, getting inspiration from books like this on growth and form by Darcy Wentworth Thompson. Um, but biology of today is different than biology of 100 years ago for a number of reasons. Um, it's now possible to do a lot of things uh, that it wasn't possible to do 100 years ago, and that changes our understanding of biology and also how we can use biology as a design tool. Here you're seeing how um, you can grow these days uh, individual cells in small glass plates rather than cells uh, in an organism, and you can subject them to a bunch of different environmental conditions uh, through feeding them liquids and measure their response. You can create images, uh, moving images or still images at high resolution, uh, like you saw there. You can create um, ways of monitoring living organisms and the way they grow. This is slime mold growing to reach uh, dots, which are points of resources or sugar. Um, and it forms an efficient and robust uh, and redundant network that's actually useful for designing things at a completely different scale, like railway networks and highway networks. Um, much of this work is uh, done by some people we're collaborating with, including Ali Brivenloo, who uh, is a molecular embryologist at Rockefeller University. He studied tadpoles for many years. That was a kind of typical growth of tadpoles. But he's invented a way to take a living tadpole, you can see its heart beating there, and uh, monitor the firing of its neurons or its uh, brain signals in real time through quantum dots. 
Um, this is uh, some other work from Ali Brivenloo's lab. This is basically showing um, how stem cells communicate with one another through sending uh, small chemical signals and determine whether to grow into skin or bone uh, or muscles. Um, and finally, this is another collaborator we're working with who studies the way bacteria grow into colonies. Um, these are colonies about the shape of a quarter. Um, and uh, they create these very complex topological shapes. And we're using some techniques of computation, some relatively new techniques like computer vision and machine learning to try to um, take this very complex growth of a biological system and uh, learn from it and encapsulate it in a computer model. So we're trying to gather data from the growth and figure out a way um, to, uh, to put that type of growth in a computer model. So all of these things, I would argue, are very different than the biology um, from Darcy Wentworth Thompson. Um, and I'm now going to show you one very quick version of how we're um, trying to design with that in mind. Um, so here's yet another biologist we're collaborating with. This is a plant biologist named Fernand Federici. And he has this incredible, very expensive microscope that allows you to take um, photographs at high resolution at one micron depth uh, slices. So these are tiny, tiny slices of tiny, tiny objects, cells. And here we're studying the exoskeletons of xylem cells. Xylem cells are the cells that grow in the stems of plants. Um, and we're able to take those exoskeletons, um, put their uh, 3D geometry into the computer, um, and then do things like this. Capture um, a data set of things like the length of each bar, the, the angle of each bar, and use uh, another piece of software which allows you to feed in any Excel spreadsheet, any data set, um, and uh, develop an equation um, that describes that data. Um, and so I know that's a lot of information, but the point is that that allows us to uh, recreate a xylem cell that existed in the natural world by creating a straight blue center line and then generate something very similar to what existed in the real world. But also to predict with pretty good accuracy how a xylem cell might grow if it was growing in an L shape, which a xylem cell never has to do in nature. But if we can understand how it grows, if we can put that model into the computer, then we can apply that logic this biological algorithm, we can apply it to scenarios um, that are unique um, and that are invented by us. So we can use the xylem cell as a design tool. And here, back to um, the new design approach, is what we're exploring as one way of uh, using that xylem cell algorithm. So we're arguing that the first design approach shown on the left is a kind of traditional design approach, which is to um, create a sketch of something like a chair, something you want to design, a kind of napkin sketch, a low resolution stick figure version, and then gradually figure out how to bring that to life by thinking about thicknesses, connection details, um, what kind of materials you're able to create. Um, what we're interested in exploring is that maybe we could take some um, things that we know we want about an object like a chair. For example, we could know we want a seat that's a certain shape, but then allow that we sketch out, instead of the legs of a chair, sketch out the potential design space of what's going to support the chair and allow a system of computation and biology to help us uh, uncover new possibilities for the, the design of a chair. Um, so uh, we create this algorithm loosely based on the xylem cell uh, growth where we can um, take that seat of a chair, um, uh, array some points underneath that chair, connect them up with a small kind of exoskeleton or lattice, and create a version of a chair. Um, we can create a version that uh, looks fairly uh, standard, like a typical chair. But we can uh, adjust a few of the parameters in that model and then create an entirely different version of that chair, um, which might not have four legs at all. Um, or um, it might have a very unusual arrangement of four legs, or three legs, or legs that merge together. Um, 
The interesting thing here is that not all of these designs, this is not necessarily a great design of a chair, but we can use the power of the computer to generate and evaluate through things like structural simulation to evaluate many, many, many versions of a chair. Um, and the cost of doing that is nothing because once you have the computer model, you can let the computer do what it does best, which is dumb repeated calculations over and over again, generate something like 5,000 or 10,000 or hundreds of thousands of design options, which are each symbolized by a point here, um, sort them according to their type of design. That's what the color means here. Um, filter them according to high performing designs. So say that you want um, low weight of a chair and high structural performance or low displacement under load. And then navigate through a totally new design space of possible chairs. Um, this gives us the ability to think about design in new ways. We can specify things we know. We can kind of ask questions about things we don't know. We can use the power of computation, sometimes informed by biological algorithms, um, to sort out um, a huge population of designs and then hone in on designs that um, might be high performing, that hopefully will be high performing, but also would be unexpected. So discover new types of designs beyond our normal human uh, linear type of thinking, um, beyond our blind spots, our preconceptions about designs. And we can program in rules like uh, manufacturability. Um, we're using this project uh, or this approach for a number of um, uh, experiments, including some for commercial clients who are interested in the idea that we can improve upon traditional design. So if model one is the way we have typically designed things for many years, you design um, objects out of stock materials. Model two represents what we might be able to do with new techniques of manufacturing, such as 3D printing. So you can take those solid bars and you can make them out of tiny, tiny lattice shapes. That's a way to reduce the weight, um, but maintain uh, pretty much the same uh, performance. But we're most interested in Model 3, and we've been surprised to find some, uh, some shared interest among you know, major manufacturing uh, partners, including some aerospace clients, um, that are also interested in this. And that is to say, we can uh, design things like Model 3 that never would have occurred to us and never would have been possible to design by hand um, that are nevertheless interesting and useful and that reveal you know, new possibilities, new ways to understand um, designs and design space. Um, okay, and so finally, um, to come full circle, um, this is uh, in a way a project about design um, and waste and energy, and hopefully a, an approach to design that um, uses, uh, that generates less waste and uses less energy than traditional approaches. Um, it's a project um, that, uh, in a way, starts with with this loop of an ecosystem. Uh, this is the uh, carbon cycle, you know, the the normal, natural, uh, healthy cycle on the Earth. Uh, endless loop of growth and decay and then uh, regrowth and renewal. Um, and of course we know that um, our buildings and our cities um, are not great for this cycle. In other words, they tend to take high value raw materials, spend a huge amount of energy converting those raw materials into building blocks. Um, create something useful for humans, like a building, and then at the end of the useful life of that building, um, put all of that material into landfills where they last for hundreds or thousands of years. And really the guiding idea of the project was to imagine and test out uh, whether we could um, take a different approach to relating to the carbon cycle. In other words, maybe we could take low value raw materials instead of high value raw materials. Maybe we could spend almost no energy converting the raw materials into building blocks. Maybe we could build a useful building in the same way that we normally do, um, but then at the end of the useful life of the building, we could return all of that material back to the carbon cycle 
um, and not have it end up in landfills. And if we could do this, then we could really change our way of thinking about energy and raw materials and imagine that we're just temporarily borrowing materials you know, from the rest of the natural world um, to create our useful objects and then we're returning it. So we're not, we're not extracting, we're not um, changing in an irrecoverable way. Um, we're just temporarily borrowing some materials and then we're returning them back to this cycle. How could we possibly do that? Um, through this uh, magic organism, uh, which is called mycelium. So this is a microscope video of the uh, branching growth of mycelium. This is the root-like structure in mushrooms. And it turns out that you can take agricultural waste, uh, this shown here, the, the chopped up corn stalks of growing corn, not the corn kernels, not the high value stuff, but the chopped up corn stalks, the low value stuff, combine it with mycelium, put it in a mold of almost any shape, um, pack it in, and then in about five days, shown here in fast motion, the mycelium grows and fuses together uh, the agricultural waste into a useful solid object. Um, and this allows us to create um, a new type of building block, in our case, a new brick um, with almost no waste, almost no energy required, and, and therefore almost no carbon emissions. Um, here is the new type of brick we designed. We worked with this great industrial partner, a startup uh, company in upstate New York called Ecovative. Um, and we invented a new type of, of brick together. Um, this brick had never been used before um, in architecture, in outdoor large scale architecture. Um, and so we had to do a lot of testing. No one knew if this was going to work. We grew a lot of different um, types of bricks, uh, changing some various parameters, the amount of time we're growing it, um, the ratios of ingredients. For every brick we grew, we took it to a testing lab at Columbia University, subjected it to this crushing test, the same machine used to test like the cables of the George Washington Bridge you know, holding up thousands of pounds of force. Here we were um, subjecting our, you know, lightweight bricks to the same force. And the interesting thing is that here we get a, a structural uh, testing result that is unusual, um, which is to say we took our brick four inches tall, crushed it under 100,000 pounds, which would never uh, happen in, in the built environment, but it was a test to test out the limits. Normally the bricks are taking about 250 pounds, not 100,000 pounds. Um, the brick compresses to about one inch tall. So that's in a way a terrible performance of a structural building material, but the brick never failed. And that is unique and actually potentially valuable um, because even concrete um, and potentially even steel would fail under this type of load. Our structural engineers were fascinated by this performance of a material that would never fail. It would continue changing, um, but it would never catastrophically fail. Um, we tested dozens and dozens of bricks in various varieties. We also tested assemblies of bricks. So we wanted to know how did one single brick perform, but also how did a, an assembly of these bricks perform together. Um, and this was not only interesting, it was absolutely necessary because, um, as you could probably guess, there is no drop-down menu item in structural analysis software for mushroom brick. You know, you can't, you can't know how this material is going to perform based on past results because there are no past results. So we had to work with our structural engineers, work with the testing lab at Columbia, work with the startup company that was helping us make this material and figure out how to safely design with this new building material. Um, in our first round, meaning our first uh, version of the brick and our first shape of the macro structure, um, we analyzed the structure under um, hurricane force winds, which you have to do in New York these days. Um, and the red areas are basically um, areas where you get too much displacement. This is 30 inches of displacement under 75 mile an hour winds. Um, not good, um, but after about um, seven rounds of redesigning the brick, redesigning the overall structure, we got to a place that we all felt comfortable with. Now, we would have liked to keep doing this testing, but every aspect of this project um, 
was very compressed in terms of time. So we got to a place that was just good enough where we felt uh, comfortable with the design, the uh, structural engineers felt comfortable with the design. Um, another important aspect of this material um, that we were trying to use as a new type of load-bearing brick is that it's different on the outside than the inside. So here's a couple of bricks that have been cut in half. And you see this kind of white layer on the outside, this kind of crust. Um, and on the inside, it's much more crumbly. And this basically means that unlike traditional bricks, you can't cut them on site uh, to make the overall uh, shapes of a building that you want, especially if you have complex geometry. Um, so here we had to use yet another uh, type of design approach and a design tool. Um, this is showing how we iterated through the design of a single brick, which had to be calibrated according to the way we could create the molds to grow the bricks in. So these are thermal forming constraints. We settled on a type of brick, and this brick was very good at creating straight walls or curved walls, singly curved walls. But when you got a doubly curved wall, um, then it would work to a point, but then it would stop working based on the rule because you wouldn't be able to create uh, a line of bricks that added up to any type of length of line, course length, that you want. Um, they wouldn't uh, fill. So we could space the bricks out more, um, but then that left bricks sitting improperly on each other. Um, then we experimented with adding a couple of different spacer bricks or a second type of brick unit. Um, a quarter brick, a half brick, either one of those alone didn't work. And finally, what worked was both having a quarter brick and a half brick, then spacing out um, the layer to meet the course length, which was one requirement, but then also checking every single brick for whether it was resting properly on two other bricks. Because each brick needs two inches of resting on each brick below it in order to span and act like a system. This is a process that we could only do with a computer. You couldn't have done that by hand to create that complex geometry out of those brick types and make sure that every um, single brick uh, was working in the right way. Um, despite feeling pretty good about the way the bricks should be laid out, there were dozens of issues that we hadn't figured out by the time of construction, but we had to start anyway. And this is about three weeks of on-site uh, construction uh, in the courtyard of PS1. And the interesting thing about this part of the project was that we had two different um, groups of people working on the project. We had Columbia University Master of Architecture students who know a lot about geometry and digital fabrication. And we had New York City brick masons who know a lot about um, laying bricks. Neither one alone, neither group alone, knew enough to solve the problems of this new type of construction. Uh, only together could they figure out how to lay these new type of bricks in this complex overall macro form, um, have everything line up, have all the bricks sit properly, uh, and have the shape turn out the way we wanted, and have every brick be properly connected to the other bricks. So, it was very interesting, you know, and speaking of our ecosystem of design, where we had here an ecosystem of expertise, an ecosystem of labor um, that we were working with on the fly um, to, to build this thing and, uh, and learn as we were going. I should note here, while I'm talking about labor, that we paid every single worker uh, who helped us on this project, unlike some of the past uh, versions of this PS1 installation. Um, and that was important for us, too, to, to kind of engage a kind of a healthy and sustainable way of making things uh, required that we do that. Um, here you see uh, a photo of the finished uh, project, um, about 40 feet tall, 10,000 bricks. And you can see it in the context of the city. Um, so in the background, you see the glass and steel skyscrapers of Manhattan. In the foreground, you see some of the traditional brick buildings uh, of Queens. And in many ways, our project was in kind of dialogue with those types of construction. Um, it was also designed to frame the natural environment. And on the top, you see these uh, reflective bricks. And these are basically taking the growing trays um, that we made the bricks in. You know, you need to grow them in a tray, like you saw in the video. Um, and we're taking the growing trays and putting them on the top of the structure. Um, so we're reusing the manufacturing tools 
Um, but also we're getting an interesting visual effect out of that because these growing trays are reflective plastic and they bounce light down into the structure. They're placed in the locations that capture the most sunlight on the interior face and therefore put light down uh, into the structure. Um, here you can see um, some of the small apertures or windows um, in, the, in the building and basically these are places where we had a quarter brick in the computer layout that we determined wasn't exactly necessary to hold up the structure. Um, so you could punch it out and still have proper bearing. And we did that for kind of visual effect. And this was important for us because we wanted to test out not only the technical capability of this new building material, you know, was it strong enough? Was it robust enough? Would it uh, be durable, you know, through the rain and uh, the UV exposure? We wanted to test out the technical stuff, sure, but we wanted to also test out the kind of atmospheric capability of this material. Would it be something that's um, fun to design with? Could we create interesting space with it? Would it have interesting effects of light and shadow and texture uh, and pattern? And so the inside of the space and the way that it felt to be inside um, was as important as some of the other aspects of the project, like could we scale up, could we make 10,000 of these bricks um, in a uh, repeatable way, um, could we create a large scale structure out of this stuff. The ultimate test of any PS1 project is its ability to host a party. Um, and um, you see that there's this double use of the courtyard that's you know, a, a location for testing out an experimental architecture idea, but it's also the location where 5,000 people come every Saturday to hear experimental electronic music. And this was fitting for us because in a way we wanted to test out this new idea, this new material and this new method of construction. We wanted to test it out out in the world, out in the city, out in culture, um, rather than testing it in a lab or testing it, you know, off-site somewhere like a facade mock-up is typically done. You know, we didn't want to test this thing in a corner of the Brooklyn Navy Yard where no one would see it and we would just measure it with instruments. We wanted to test it out in the public. Um, one other test of the project was uh, the kind of life it took on in social media. Um, and this was interesting to us too, because you know, as we're adding in these forces and these loops of the ecosystem, the things we're trying to monitor and think about in designing, um, it was now possible, it's now possible in some projects, to see in kind of real time some weird version of public response to your project. You know, a version of responding to your project in terms of snapshots, you know, so images, but also very small um, text um, comments um, and some of them are trivial and not helpful, but overall, especially if you aggregate this type of comment and this type of image, you can start to learn something about you know, your, your own project and the viability of an idea. We had the opportunity to create um, a parallel installation in the lobby of the Museum of Modern Art and, uh, at the same time. And here we wanted to um, test out some other things about the material and the construction. Um, so we were testing out some different forms, some different um, uh, colors and textures of the material uh, using natural compostable dyes. And this was basically a way to, um, to uh, communicate to ourselves and to a, a bigger audience that this project was not about you know, a single installation as object. It was about a, a new system that could have you know, multiple ways to play out. Um, you know, if there's maybe one thing to say about the project, um, to summarize what it's about, it may be this, that it was a, a, a design approach and a project and a building, a temporary building, that was designed to disappear as much as it was designed to appear. So if you think about most buildings, they're really designed to appear. They're designed for the day that they're finished. They're designed for people to, um, comment on and live in them, you know, when they're there and especially on the day that they open and the photographs are taken. Um, and our project was really, in a way, almost the reverse of that. It was designed uh, for its capacity to disappear, for its ability to decompose after it was done, 
um, in, in um, a meaningful way. It was designed for a lot of the invisible qualities um, that are still an important part of architecture. In other words, it was a project that was designed to go from crops to construction to compost and then back to crops. Um, and that is because we took all of these uh, bricks, all 10,000 bricks, um, at the end of the life of the building, uh, we deconstructed them, um, worked with a composting partner called Build It Green, a nonprofit organization in New York City, um, and put these bricks into compost piles, and they have now all returned to soil. And it's actually high quality soil, um, and we've given that back to um, community gardens in the neighborhood in Queens and local uh, city tree planting um, to start the cycle again. Thank you.